for this, the final session of Circuit for Glasgow's Get Inspired Week 2020. It's um, certainly been a really quick week for the team, um, but I do hope you've been able to join some of the previous conversations and that it's given you some real food for thought around the circular economy and Glasgow and its key sectors. I do think that we have, however, saved the best for last, and I'm delighted that this morning that we're discussing the circular economy opportunity within the manufacturing sector and disrupting, designing and manufacturing a circular economy. The uh, Circular Glasgow team has been really starting to work with the manufacturing sector, although it is absolutely massive, and um, we've been working alongside partners such as Zero Waste Scotland and Scottish Engineering to really start to try and encourage businesses within the manufacturing sector to really innovate and take action. As I've said, the manufacturing sector is huge and it covers a variety of industry and business from traditional industry, you know, if you think back to Glasgow with its shipbuilding heritage, right the way up to some of the kind of cutting edge aerospace um, industry 4.0. Um, and of course, the city itself is still very much at the forefront of some of this manufacturing innovation. You just have to look at the city region where we're home to the Advanced Forming Research Centre and the National Inst Manufacturing Institute for Scotland. So Glasgow really is at the forefront for this opportunity. Um, but with this comes a real ability to adopt circular business models within this. And Given the city has a really ambitious target to be net zero for carbon by 2030, um, circular economy opportunities are really important for businesses to start to consider and of course to support a more resilient supply chain. So I'm delighted that we're going to be looking a bit more at this this morning. As always, we're really keen for you to get involved in the conversation today. So if you if you would like to ask any questions, please do use the chat function on the platform. And if you can, when you do, please do use or add your name and organisation and I'll try and get this to the panel. We're also going to be using social media. And um, so for those of you who don't already follow us in Circular Glasgow, and of course, if you don't, why don't you? Um, but please do follow us there and use the hashtag circular future if you'd like to share your thoughts in the session. Finally is one last sort of housekeeping point of view and um, the session is being recorded so if you would like to re-watch this session or any of the sessions that have taken place across the week and I would encourage you to do that there's some, been some fantastic content across the week they will be available on our YouTube channel which is Glasgow Chamber of Commerce um, from tomorrow so I would encourage you to take a look at that. So, you've heard enough from me. I'd like to get started and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by a range of fantastic speakers from across the manufacturing sector. As I said, it's such a varied industry and we've tried to reflect this today. I'm delighted to be joined by Joe Chidley, founder of Beauty Kitchen UK, one of the UK's 50 most innovative and disruptive uh, businesses, so delighted to hear more about that, by Dr Warren Bowden, Managing Director of Operations at Scottish Leather Group Technology, which is a mouthful, but I got there, mm -hmm. and uh, Warren's also one of our Circular Glasgow Ambassadors, so, so thank you, and we'll come to both of them first to think about circular manufacturing in the first instance. I'm also delighted to be joined by Michelle Ferguson, Director of Scotland's Bravest Manufacturing Company, and there's a fantastic story there that I'm keen to hear more about and by Lawrence Nolley from Roet Spikes, who's joining us from the Netherlands. So a huge thank you for joining us this morning. We really appreciate you coming. Um, and of course, we're also joined by Colin Kennedy, who is the Sector Manager for Manufacturing from Zero Waste Scotland, who, as I've said, are one of our partners. And delighted that Colin will be able to share a bit more about how the um, Zero Waste Scotland can support the sector to look at circular economy. So with that in mind, Warren, can I come to you first? Leather um, is one of the traditional industries and Scottish Leather Group itself, I think, was established in the 1800s. Um, but even so, you're still very much at the forefront of adopting and disrupting the business model. I think you've recently set targets to be sort of uh, carbon neutral by 2025 and zero process waste to landfill. So could you tell us a bit more about these measures and how you actually intend to, to, to reach those ambitious targets? Thank you, Cheryl. Um, thank you for the introduction. I'm uh, delighted to, 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 I think, share 
the journey we've had for the past 15 or so years um, and I think take you forward into 2025. I think for, for many, leather is probably one of those curious industries where we all, we all sort of know what the product is, but we don't really know where it comes from. Um, so if I might elaborate a little bit, um, obviously, you know, mummy cow meets daddy cow, the sky is up, grass is green and cows eat it is the sort of traditional way in Scotland that we produce uh, meat products. Well, 1% of that production is, is the hide. Um, and that's what we use as our raw material that goes into making leather. Um, but the, tr the traditional leather making process was very wasteful. Um, to put it in context, only about 10% of the raw material actually becomes a finished product. In our terms right now, we're about 98% use of raw material. So it's an epiphany for the, within the industry. Um, to put it in context, the coffee that's in your cup is only perhaps 2% efficient. So it sort of puts it in context. And an awful lot of the things that we see in day-to-day -day activity, we think of as being sustainable or biodegradable and so on, but they're not necessarily done in a circular way. Um, stop me if I, if I start to ramble, because I will. Um, <laughs> what, what we do is, we, I'm sure you will. Um, <laughs> there's three parts to the circularity. There's the supply chain, um, which I've already hinted at already in terms of local. Um, Scottish supply chain, Scottish beef production is already considered by the BBA uh, and various others as being net zero. According to the UK Committee on Climate Change, the whole of UK agriculture will be net zero by 2030. Um, we take a byproduct of that and we process it in our own circular way. So I'm, I'm moving my hands around in circles. And the circularity that, we, that we've created is by able to use or by being able to use the, the byproducts of our own manufacturing process, it's the other 90%. We're actually able to power and drive the production of the end product. And this is why we're so resource efficient. At the end of life, before I, before I ignore that, there is the possibility that we can take that leather back and convert that back into either secondary products or indeed use that to help drive the, the manufacture of virgin materials. So there's circularity in every single part of that supply chain. And that's something that certainly ignited the touch paper, I think, in, in several of our OEM customers globally um, who are now looking to move from the traditional linear manufacturing process within their own vehicles or aircraft, for example. Um, and actually now that they're now that they've seemingly addressed the issue or beginning to address the issue of tailpipe emissions by converting to EV, uh, many of them are now starting to focus on the actual embedded carbon content of the car or aircraft that's being manufactured. And this is what's driving some of the changes within our sector. Delighted that we were part of that, I don't know, seed. Um, so, so this is something for us has already been a 15 year journey, but we've already seeded a lot of that um, with several of our OEM customers. Um, how do we do this and how, do, how have we got it done? Well, the cornerstone of this really is the thermal energy plant, which is where I'm sat right now. Um, this is a, a patented process which converts waste through drying, gasification, heat recovery, creates steam. Steam goes into factory. Factories, hot water and, and drying technologies that's used ubiquitously through leather making. Um, and during that leather making process, obviously there's more byproducts produced, the byproducts become the waste and hey, so on goes that circularity. We're able to, to capture, as I said, something like 98% of the total resource um, that we receive as, as raw materials to convert that into new product. So for as long as mummy cow meets daddy cow and the sky's up and grass is green, and for as long as we're able to keep that circularity running, we're able to continue with a, a sustainable business. I don't know if that's, a, if that's just helped to whet the appetite, Cheryl. No, absolutely. That's fantastic. And you've actually touched on a couple of things I wanted to ask you about more in detail. Um, supply chain something I'll probably come back to, but just um, sort of one other question before I move to Joe that I wanted to ask in the first instance was the role of design. Um, you know, designs obviously have a large part of the circular economy from a sort of manufacturing point of view, but how important has that been to, to Scottish Leather Group? And, you know, has it changed much? You know, you're, it's a very traditional industry, but, you know, has it changed over the years? 
I think it is changing. I think um, if you look at where the end product goes to, for example, our leather mostly ends up as a upholstery leather in some form of transport sector or mass transit sector. So if you look, you know, more recently, you might be thinking about um, antimicrobial surfaces. Well, leather is, um, or our leather is. And if you look at things like uh, the design of a seat, for example, and the, if you like, the composite structure of the seat and the ability to dismantle those elements of the seat in order to facilitate take back and, and, and recirculation or recycling. Um, they're all elements that are under, I'd say under this, under scrutiny right now. Um, we're working with a couple of OEMs and I can't say too much about it, but their direction of travel over the next five years is for the entire interior of the vehicle to be fully circular. So it's not just about um, having you know, percentage recycled plastic or or other materials or, or metal within the car, it's actually having the whole of the car entirely circular. So they're beginning to move away from the linear, linear supply chains where the circularity of that material includes the ability to take it back. In terms of design, that means, means that things like seat design changes, it means that the interiors of vehicles changes, and you've probably noticed that in some of the EVs. Um, they, they seem a lot more simple, um, digital screens and much, much simpler materials of construction. Um, lightweight is also becoming a, an element here, um, but the key the key aspect of this is that the material that originally goes into the vehicle or whatever it, whatever the application is has to in itself be circular, um, and then be able to be taken back at end of life. And some of the thinking here comes from things like life cycle analysis studies, which um, do obviously start and stop with the you know, the start and stop of manufacturing, but that's challengeable too. Um, on the basis that if you can take the material back, at what point does that life cycle stop? If it's entirely circular, then it, you know, can you measure a circular, circular uh, manufacturing process? This sort of thinking is changing the way that interiors of vehicles are being designed and how the materials are being specified. Um, we at the moment present a lowest carbon leather um, into those sectors, but I think what we're now drifting into um, is a sustainable interiors market as opposed to just being a leather producer. Okay, thank you. And Joe, if I could come to you now, um, you're obviously a much more modern company. I think you were founded in about 2014. Um, and as I've said, you're one of the UK's most disruptive companies. But can you tell us a bit more about why sustainability and circular economy is very much at the heart of what you do? Um, and a bit, a bit more about your business model and journey? Yeah, I mean, we are a young company and one of the areas that we wanted to focus in on when we started was to bring the circular economy and cradle to cradle principles to everyday consumer products. And that was the ethos of, of starting Beauty Kitchen. The beauty industry is not known for sustainability, yeah? Um, and that's where we thought from a disruption perspective, we knew that that was where the future would be. And we were ahead of the curve in what we were doing. So everyone thought we were mad to go use cradle to cradle principles, reusable packaging. You know, why would you invest in something that is such a long term strategy? Um, that mm -hmm. obviously impacts your short term profit. And, you know, the reason for that is we are a B Corp certified business. So the way that we think about culturally how we go about business is not in a linear way anyway. <laughs> and it means that we have future proofed our business, but that wasn't the only thing we wanted to do. What we've wanted to do is take the beauty industry with us. So we are very open source and transparent with how we formulate, how we um, put our packaging together and how we can ensure that that fits into the circular economy. Um, and I have, you know, a hero of mine is, is Bill uh, McDonough, obviously. And we, we are really fortunate that he's a mentor for our business. And, you know, he has said that we are the most sustainable beauty company in the world. And we don't want to be 
the only one. In fact, I would rather a Unilever or a Procter & Gamble knocked me off or knocked Beauty Kitchen rather off that quote because the biggest impact comes from the big companies. But where we can play a part is we can play a part in innovation and we can drive the conversation and prove that beauty products can be circular, they can be scalable, they can be commercially viable and profitable. And I think because the linear economy is very much based on commercials and finance and accountants, I think if you can prove and speak to that audience and introduce the circular economy, then the question to those businesses would be, why wouldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. And how have you found that? I mean, obviously you, you sort of work with a lot of UK companies and, and international companies increasingly as part of the supply chain. You know, are you finding that conversation change? You know, are you getting more of the buy-in? Well, um, hmm. I wouldn't say it was positive engaged buy-in. What I would say is that we set out that this is how we want things done. But rather than passing that over as a problem to our suppliers and supply chain, we work with them. And I wanted to just show a sort of quick example of something, yeah? So everybody has seen a jar with lids and labels, yeah? And none of that fits into the circular economy because it can't be even recycled, yeah? Never mind, you know, fully circular. And what we've actually done is we've worked with our packaging supplier to retool the lid so that it's embossed, so we don't need the label. And inside you have this little insert, yeah? The insert used to have glue on it. It now doesn't because it fits in and we can just pop it out. And this lid can then be washed, reused. We do have to put another insert in. That's next on my list to get resolved. But as we know with sustainability, it's progress, not perfection. It, but this piece and this tooling is available to anyone that wants it. We haven't you know, kept that to ourselves. We've worked with Richmond containers so that we can encourage other people to do something that is more circular than um, a lid with a, a label and a glue dot. And I think it's some of these little simple demonstrations, but also for companies to share as much as they can that really will push and nudge the dial, particularly in Glasgow, as you said, a lot of businesses are, are traditional and they might be sitting thinking, I don't know what I can do. You know, how do I make those changes? And for me, I would say just take it in bite sized chunks and don't try to do everything at the one time because it will be too costly, too time consuming and you might feel overwhelmed. And that just isn't good for business. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's a really nice point there. Um, Colin, I know that you obviously work with a lot of businesses across the manufacturing sector. It might just be good to maybe give maybe one or two examples of how you've supported businesses in the manufacturing sector recently. So uh, probably uh, worth just saying that uh, the, we work with quite a wide range of uh, companies uh, across the manufacturing sector. Uh, as was just discussed here just now, there it is that uh, identifying areas that you can change or adapt and uh, taking that forward uh, with support that we provide uh, to engagement with myself uh, and uh, uh, the fund area, which we'll, we'll cover later. Uh, is looking at trying to uh, uh, take those projects, take those ideas, and uh, and drive them forward. Uh, there are uh, so many ways in which companies can uh, make uh, small changes. Some of those changes can become big changes, which is what we're looking to encourage. And uh, so areas that we've looked at recently would be uh, subscription models, uh, Servitization models and uh, that 
uh, take back uh, uh, in terms of uh, probably the, the most uh, recent We've got uh, examples of on this on the uh, service models for lighting, which is EGG lighting, um, uh, on subscription models for uh, face coverings, uh, prickly thistle uh, up in the up in the Highlands, and um, on the take back models for uh, bottle reuse would be TRI uh, Greenock, uh, looking at. Uh, uh, a trial of uh, recovery of sanitizer bottles for uh, uh, reuse. So that's, that's a great example, um, uh, given given the challenges, uh, very obviously recent uh, challenges with uh, with COVID uh, and the supply chain obviously becoming uh, quite fragmented. So uh, we've got quite a, I, I could probably give you lots of examples, I could probably take up hours of time, but uh, if, um, and also draw everyone's attention uh, to the CE Accelerator uh, website we've got. It's got some great stories about uh, companies we work with, and maybe some uh, inspiration uh, for changes to uh, their own business models. Great, thanks for that. Um, jo, there's a question in from um, Rebecca Ricketts, um, and it actually ties into something I wanted to ask you about myself, and, and Warren will maybe come back to you on this as well. But in terms of the, the sort of models that you've introduced, so in terms of servitisation, you very much have, you know, sort of refill, repeat um, as a sort of core business product. How have you found that relationship with your customer? Um, you know, has it changed? You know, are you finding consumers are demanding more of this? So um, every day, customers are demanding more sustainable products. What is interesting is that there's a there's obviously a range of what they think sustainability is, and we try to engage with everyone in that conversation, whether they are a bit nerdy like me um, and really into that or it's just someone that doesn't want to use plastic bottles anymore. So the range can be quite significant. What we've had in terms of feedback very recently is we launched a, a hand sanitizer range recently due to, to COVID. We were actually asked to do that by the Scottish government um, and we directed our business um, specifically to produce hand sanitizers. But those hand sanitizers were produced in reusable, refillable bottles. And we also sold them direct to our consumers from our website, but also through. And what customers have fed back to us is hand sanitizer is kind of hand sanitizer. Yeah. The difference being that they want something in a reusable bottle. And that's what's driven the the story for Beauty Kitchen. Now I can say my hand sanitizer is better than anyone else's, but but really that's where the beauty industry is going. Because from a formulation perspective, you know, a moisturizer, a cleanser, a hand sanitizer, yes, you can say that your ingredients are the best in the world. Yes. But the point of difference that is becoming very clear is that people don't just want that they also want to understand the sustainability of the product and the packaging. And the whole plastic debate is absolutely huge in the beauty industry at the moment. It's huge. And the other thing is, there is we have demonstrated that you don't need to use plastic bottles. We know that the infrastructure doesn't work. You know, less than 9% of plastic is recycled because of the lack of infrastructure. But in the beauty industry, the single-use plastic is a disgrace. Um, but what we want to do is show how it can be done differently and how it's still cost-effective and profitable. And our return, refill, repeat model is something that is not just for Beauty Kitchen, that's actually a standard that sits on its own. And we will accept anyone that has reusable packaging and give them the help and advice of what that packaging would be in the beauty industry and in other categories. And then they can use the return, refill, repeat program to be able to have their packaging and bottles and jars um, washed, refilled and sent back out. And that's really what we want to do, not just in the beauty industry, we want to bring that alive for other categories. 
Great, thank you. And Warren, just very quickly before I go to, to Michelle and Lawrence, because I know that I'm really keen to bring them in and I can see them nodding along. Um, in terms of this sort of idea of take back and servitisation, is this something that Scottish Leather Group are looking into? You know, do you have any examples or sort of things in the pipeline that you can maybe sort of share without sharing too much? Yeah, without sharing too much, um, we already do this uh, in terms of taking back, for example, aircraft seats, putting them back through our process. So we can imagine where you supply an entire aircraft set, might be 300 seats. Um, those seats can go around in circles. So the, the old seat come back, we can convert it back through our process and make fresh leather from it. But I think there's a couple of other elements that maybe haven't been touched on yet. I think, Joe, you might have mentioned it here, or maybe you inferred it. None of our customers are prepared to pay more for sustainable. They expect it to be sustainable. Yeah. And what we're starting to present to them is an ability to present a sustainable product, not only as a product, but actually in terms of the whole life ownership of that product. And that includes the ability to take it back or return the material back and have it refilled. And it's exactly the same psychology, I think, with you know, whole ownership costs. I think historically, you know, we go out and we buy something and then when we're finished with it, we throw it away. That's what we're trying to change. And the ability of being able to if you like, circularize that whole process where even the take back is incorporated in the cost of the production of the, of the new material, nothing is thrown away. Um, and that might change the buying model towards a leasing model. Um, it might also change the philosophy in terms of when you're actually selling something in the first place, you're not just selling that thing once, you're actually engaging with that customer. Um, and I think this is one of the areas where those of us who are um, more successful in this area of, the, of industry actually have a point of difference. We're competing with everybody else who's, who's still in a linear model yeah. on price, which is wrong. But what we're doing is we're presenting a different offering to our customers and there's more and more customers coming to it or coming to us with this type of offering. It is difficult commercially trying to justify, um, at, at least initially, why your process is more expensive than others. But actually, if you look at the customer base, many of the particularly prestige premier customers, those who can afford to do so, um, are actually making a conscious choice towards circular activity. Great, thank you. And just a reminder to, to the delegates, if you do have questions, please do put them in the chat function. Lawrence, I wanted to come to you now because I know that this is very much part of your model and, and, and of Michelle's as well, but could you perhaps tell us a bit more about Rowett's Bikes and, and your ethos and why the circular economy is a core part of that? Yeah, thanks for uh, for having me from, from the Netherlands. Um, yeah, the circular philosophy has been with us since the start. Uh, Root Spikes has been inspired by the automotive uh, industry, strange enough, where there was sort of a natural selection of, uh, uh, of gearboxes and engines that, uh, you know, uh, reached a certain uh, age uh, and then had a better performance than uh, even newly produced uh, components. And that uh, inspired uh, us to, to take that remanufacturing philosophy and take that to another industry uh, uh, and an industry with an abundance of resources uh, here in, in Amsterdam and specifically the Netherlands. Um, there's one million bicycles being discarded in Holland alone each year. Uh, nice. And what we basically do is, uh, uh, and, and that's where our route started, we upcycle a proportion of the uh, bicycle uh, bicycles into brand new bicycles and, and e-bikes. Uh, and we sell that as new uh, products, uh, high performance bikes. Uh, so it's not a positioning as a second hand bike, it's really a new bike. And we sell that uh, through customers via uh, retailers and also online. Um, and next to that, we have a um a business to business service model where we have taken that circular approach and turned that into a remanufacturing service where we take existing bicycle uh, assets or fleets uh, you see bicycle uh, fleets and shared bike services popping up all around the world um and uh, we take the existing assets and and sort of have an end of life cycle uh, solution that uh, bicycles that 
used to be discarded or, or shipped off to development countries uh, after their first life cycle. Um, we, we take them in, uh, dismantle, uh, and then we are able to reuse up to 80% of the bicycle components measured by weight uh, um, and, and, and reuse that in that exact same bike uh, and return the bike to the same owner. So it's, it's really a closed loop. Uh, and a life cycle that is um, uh, yeah, optimized uh, and has a positive uh, business case as well. Uh, and I, I would like to bring, uh, responding to the other inputs, I would like to bring one difference, I think, that I see in, in my uh, industry compared to the fast-moving com consumer goods we have been talking about, uh, and, and then specifically Joe's example. Um, we see that consumers still think that the bicycle itself is sustainable enough uh, because it's always compared to a car and you know a bike is much more sustainable by by using it um, and then other factors came into play to 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 decide to decide what bike to to buy huh? so it's more qualitative aspects still uh, battery range uh, performance of motor uh, so, as in terms of selling our products, I think in 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 the in the in the business of bicycle, uh, uh, we're we're still trying to, or I see myself and my organization more moving to uh, more commercial types of of selling the product, uh, sort of traditional ways. Uh, and having the circular uh, aspects being kind of a second reason for, for consumers uh, not to buy it and, and not, not really the first. Uh, because we're, we're simply too early. Uh, circular concept in, in our industry is, is really sort of uh, a new uh, and not really asked by uh, consumers yet. Um, in a B2B uh, model, that's different uh, because we see that Remanufacturing has a positive business case. It simply generates money. It prolongs life cycles. So that's a much more easier story to, to sell and to tell. Absolutely. And certainly some of what you're saying there and what the panel has been saying all morning resonated across the various sessions. Um, you know, you have the sort of the mainstreaming was very much a, a conversation of the construction sector. You know, how do you mainstream the circular economy? And even yesterday talking about food and drink, that idea of language and how you actually communicate that language is something that I think yeah. we're all still wrestling with. You know, it was, um, you know, there's there's lots there to unpick. Um, Michelle, I'm really keen to, to bring you into the conversation just now because I know that remanufacturing is a big part of what you do at Scotland's Bravest. Um, could you maybe tell us a bit more about Scotland's Bravest and, and maybe some of the kind of the challenges or benefits you've found from adopting circular practices within that as well? Um, yeah, Scotland's Bravest is a social enterprise. We employ veterans and others with disabilities. Um, so very circular because it's about giving people opportunities um, who have been found that difficult, maybe being long term unemployed because of their disability or because of the lack of confidence or other issues, medical issues. Um, and we started two years ago after a report from the Scottish Government saying that if you were a veteran with a disability, you were 100% or 75% more likely to be unemployed than if you had a disability without serving for, um, in the armed forces. So we opened the social enterprise. Um, we already had a factory in Kent which was successful in manufacturing road and rail signs. And um, we opened here. Uh, we met Colin in the very early days and discussed what we should be doing. Um, we met with um, Zero Waste Scotland. We met with the Scottish Manufacturing Institute and EFRC. We wanted to do this a bit differently from other sign manufacturers manufacturing companies. Um, if you're a sign manufacturer, the scope of business that I've been given and the business cases were for routers and guillotines, very traditional skills. But we wanted people to move on from here. So come here, build the confidence, get new skills and then move on to other employment, whether it be with, within manufacturing or something completely different. 
uh, whatever that vision and that passion was for. So we looked at how we could improve the facility that we had. Um, the factory was built in the 90s. Um, it was a disabled factory or purpose-built disabled factory, but it didn't, it wasn't ready for what we were now. Um, so the, the door openings weren't wide enough. So we improved that, we put in push buttons so that it was easy access throughout the factory, just made it more a, a better working environment. Um, we improved insulation, we changed the lighting systems, all the things that everybody should think of when they're doing manufacturing. We then started looking at how we manufactured and we looked at you know, sort of different ways of manufacturing, laser cutters, you know, sort of the guillotines, the routers, the zoomed machines. And we decided to go with a water jet cutter because it's a better environmental impact because you use a garnet, which is a mineral, which can go back into the land without causing any further problems. Um, and decided to go with that. So that was our first piece of machinery that we bought. Um, everyone thought we were absolutely mad because no other you know, sort of sign company would buy a water jet cutter. So that that was the the starting process, and then you know we started getting orders in, and I thought, wait a minute, we are manufacturing road signs. Road and rail signs are made of a composite material, so it's an aluminium composite. You've got vinyl, you've got aluminium, and you've got a polymer in the middle. And my first question was, what happens at end of life? Because that's what we as manufacturers should all think of. Whatever we are producing, we should always ask the question, what's, what happens at the end? And a couple of really large companies said, I don't know. And these are companies who are part of you know, £19 billion pounds infrastructure business. UK. So it's £19 billion pounds worth of business goes into infrastructure and they didn't know where their signs went. So I asked around, finally found out they go to landfill. So AFRC had tweeted when we said we were starting. So I tweeted back and said, we are now here. Do you want to meet? Initially they were, yeah, that's great. Couldn't see any value in doing it because nobody had ever come with the question of what happens to a sign? You know, they're looking at, you know, what can you do with global organisations, not a little company round the road in Bishopton working in a factory. So eventually we met somebody who thought, you know, we can maybe do something with this. And we started working with the Light Manufacturing Centre and Strathclyde University. And we came up with a process for remanufacturing. And my idea had to be take it and reuse it. That would have been the ideal way is if we could have got this back, you know, bent and and then flattened, got the vinyl off and reapplied new vinyl. We can't do that. It's, we haven't found a solution for doing that as yet. It's not saying we can't, we haven't found the solution. We have found a way of taking all the, the parts so we can get everything. We can get the vinyl off, we can get the aluminium off and we can get the polymer which means we can then resell them and they can be used in other products. Um, we've only done stage one. So although you're saying we're remanufacturing, we're not doing it yet. We've got stage one, we've got proof of concept. I can't tell you how we do it, but we can do it. I have got, or we have got a big application in to take this to stage two, which would be, allow us to then start delivering this. Um, with Fair Scotland, who are very passionate about it too, um, and Transport Scotland. Um, they see the vision and the importance of it and all these. Now, if you, at the moment, we're producing maybe about £30,000 a month in these signs. They're guaranteed for seven years. They don't last for seven years. How often do you see a new sign going up? You know, sort of, there'll be a change, there'll be an addition. So, yeah, it's a lot of money and a lot of size and a lot of land. Though. So, yeah, we, we that is our aim and our passion it is to make that happen. Um, Bear, I mentioned Bear because Bear were one of our biggest first clients. Um, we spoke to them in 1919 and or end of 1918 and said, look, you know, at the moment, you're producing your signs in Plymouth. 
and they are travelling to Scotland. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that and how could we help you with that? And what are your emissions in that? And they said, absolutely, let's look at it, really got it, got what we were trying to do, got who we were, really believed in the social enterprise values and ready to do it. So they've had their emissions for travelling for those parts, bringing them, buying them for us in Scotland, for Scotland. So it's just been great that we've had buy-in from major companies and they took a massive risk because we were delivering, you know, we were lucky we had a couple of contracts and they brought this contract that, you know, sort of is maybe worth anything between quarter of a million to half a million pounds a year to this little new factory in Scotland with three people working in it, you know, and sort of on the factory floor. And there's now 20 odd of us and are aimed to get to the so yeah, it's we try to do circular from manufacturing. Hopefully this is our passion that we cannot have this anymore. Our aim is sale and return. You'll buy your signs from us and then we'll remanufacture them. Well, not remanufacture, take them apart and sell them on. And then we'll license that. Like Joe was saying, it's really important that we don't just keep the information to ourselves, that we share it because if we just do this, we can only do a certain percentage. If this is done everywhere and globally, because at the moment this is just a UK wide problem, this is a global problem. Aluminium yeah. commerce is used in everything. So it, it yeah. could be a global change, a game changer. Right. Thank you so much for that. And it's a fantastic, it's one of those things where you do think, why didn't we think of that before? <laughs> I often find it's like who put the who put the sign saying you know this way up for a paper bag, and um, so that's yeah. a, a really great example. Um, we've had a question in from Helen Teeling, and um, saying that it's great that consumers' expectations are shifting more towards sustainable practices, but are manufacturers and suppliers moving at the same rate? And obviously, you're all engaged in it. But what about the kind of the wider sense from manufacturers and suppliers? And if I could go can to I? Warren in the first, oh, uh, if I can come to Warren and then Michelle. Yeah, sure. I again, thank you for that introduction. I I agree. I think we're ahead of the the rest of our sector um, in terms of presenting what we do to um, to support them. Most of the, them's are the OEM automotives. Um, however, we are, and we created an epiphany by what we did. We are way ahead the rest of the suppliers in the global supply chain. Um, but I think it, I'm getting the impression, particularly over recent months, maybe it's just recent months that's triggered thoughts. Um, but I do think there is a bit of a shift in the market, not just in terms of um, the customers, but also one or two of our, if you like, competitors, if, if there's such a thing, um, who are also trying to do their bit to do better. So, you know, the word sustainability didn't occur in the leather industry until we started using it, which was about 10 years ago. And now everybody's saying it. Uh, we started talking about circularity and guess what? There was a webinar last, last month. We weren't involved in it, but it was about circularity and leather. So I think they are getting there, but the timescales here are, are very, very long. Just to put in context, the, the, the thermal plant that we've created was a radical innovation. It's taken 10 years, I think, for the, the benefit of that to stop into the product and then for the the oem customers to begin to embrace it so it is a long supply chain uh, I, I, I don't think this sort of thing happens very quickly particularly in the sort of scale of market that we're dealing with the glo global automotive and transport sectors are enormous um, and it does take an awful lot of time for that traction to take place and it usually starts as i said earlier at the prestige or the premier end of, of the business and if you look at our customer base um, they're almost half the Formula One grid are named amongst that. So, you know, that sort of pinnacle of the market is where we are, uh, but it gradually filters down um, to more mainstream. Great. Thank you. Michelle? Um, I think the game changer is frameworks are beginning to actually say, what are you doing for circular economy? And when I say frameworks, that, that's government. So that's Scotland Excel and the Scottish government's frameworks are actually asking what you're doing with regard to circular economy. 
you know, sort of social enterprises, SMEs, you know, sort of actually trying to get people to think what they should be doing better. You know, what are their partners? You know, sort of we 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 talk about you know, sort of linear economy a lot and how that's changing and what we're doing is changing it. But I think lots of other organisations, because they're gently being pushed, I'd like them to be pushed harder. But I think we're we're definitely leading the way in Scotland. Our sister organisation in England aren't finding so much of that, but here we're definitely being pushed to do more, and I think that's great. Brilliant. Um, Lawrence, you know, you had a thought around that that you sort of put into um, around sort of public tender, public tenders in terms of requirements. I also just wanted to ask you a bit around sort of measuring performance of your supply chain um, and how you do that, and I'd also then like to ask that of Joe. Okay, yeah, so, so my, my comment was related to uh, indeed tender requirements. Uh, in the bicycle industry, we see that that makes an, Im an imp uh, impact on how big manufacturers, large manufacturers in the bicycle industry um, look at their products. And another important factor, I think, is also subscription models and, and lease models. If you shift the ownership, uh, manufacturers uh, start to realize that there is a lot of value in their product still in the end of life cycle and that really is a game changer in how they look at taking that product back adding uh, value to it to bring it back to a new standard and i think if we can get that ball rolling uh, um, you, you you see really change happening because then it's not pure uh, from um, you know sustainability motives but, but there's financial motives uh, there um and then you asked about how we measure our supply chain yeah measuring the performance of your supply chain yeah so basically we look at uh our um our inputs our sources and what percentage of those sources are coming from uh or are reused basically um and in our uh in the, in the collection bicycles there's 30 to 40 percent uh but in our remanufacturing processes that's like i said up to 80 percent we're now trying to uh, we're in, in the middle of the innovation project where we really want to design for uh circularity so create a bicycle that is designed to be circular designed to flow in a circular uh closed loop um and basically how we measure it is uh looking at uh what proportion of that that uh the, the, the assemblies the components um can be reused and what they're uh and how many times that that can happen so, so that's the the total uh, duration Great, thank you. And if I could just quickly turn to you, Joe, around the supply chain performance, um, and then I'll, I'll come to Colin. Yeah, for us, it's our cradle to cradle certification. So all of our manufacturing sites um, in the are in the UK, um, it's all renewable energy that's used. And if there's a blip in that renewable energy um, source then we compensate with carbon credits which isn't ideal but it's a it's a it's a progress to what that actually is and because we are looking at this on the long term coming back to both um uh, people have been talking about the leasing model you know the way that we describe it is that when you buy a bottle of shampoo are you buying it for the bottle or are you buying it for the shampoo and generally, you're buying it for the shampoo. And I think if you start to, you know, especially within fast consumer goods, you get the consumer to understand that the packaging can still be attractive, but it can be returned and refilled. You've then got a very clear commercial model that would support some of the increase in operational costs like renewable energy. So, you know, it is always about the detail and getting into the detail. But the way that we do that is through our cradle to cradle certification. 
Brilliant. So Colin, I just want to, to touch on you and it's actually a question we've got from Janet Martin um, around how we can encourage smaller organisations with, with maybe limited resources to embrace circular principles which may in the short term be more um, expensive. So I think that ties in really nicely with some of the support that Zero Waste has to offer. So if you can maybe sort of share a couple of words around that, that'd be fantastic. Yes, of course. Um, I guess um, just just to touch on what Michelle was talking about at the start is having that vision um, and uh, looking at your product and uh, what what is what is it we're actually supplying, what is we're actually making, was it made out of what is the end of life of that product? How does it impact um, uh, across the board? And you know who 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 am I selling to? And 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 do they, un they understand what the issue is about that product as well? Uh, again, with you know on on the bikes as well, is that the value of that actual product? The 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 best in companies individuals to manage that are those that made them probably in the first place as well. We have that understanding of a product and and see the true value and and save save on the, on the materials uh for, for small companies yes it is it is a big challenge um uh and they tend to be the ones that uh, push for the for the change um uh, the support that we we've got uh from uh, across zero waste uh initially we've done a lot of work with the circle economy business support where we would uh, uh support a, a, a an organization company individual looking at uh, an idea that they have that uh, they, they want to take forward, innovative, um, sort of game changing, you know, carbon uh, impact uh, and support them to uh, that service, which would be up to, generally it would be up to 30 days in, in terms of support, looking at that, doing a lot of the kind of heavy lifting and uh, so sort of market understanding of, of what the opportunities are, what the benefits are, and, we need to do naturally to get to that point. Um, that sometimes throws up quite a lot of challenges, but uh, also highlights a lot of the opportunities as well. Uh, and it's really uh, taking that uh, and looking to see how you then go and implement that. Now that might be that uh, you might need to look at the development grant that we, we have uh, or into the investment fund. Uh, development grants, you're in the range of 15, 20,000 in order to try and take a, a project forward uh, and uh, demonstrate uh, uh, the benefits of it or where it could uh, be applied uh, into the investment fund, which is really it's a big, uh, impactful uh, projects, um, which would be 50,000 up to a million in terms of, of, of what's available under the, the grant there. Um, I would say that a lot of the work we do is actually uh, engaging with uh, other stakeholders we work with as well. So it's Scottish Enterprise, Scottish Manufacturer Advisory Service, obviously Scottish uh, Institute for Remanufacture as well. Uh, there are a lot of uh, support there. The, the best thing to do is to, we can, I'm more than happy to talk to any company, uh, individuals that want to look at um, their processes or products that they have. Uh, and try and see if there's any areas that we've maybe looked at already as well, because we've done quite a lot of uh, work across uh, these, this, the circle economy support and almost, I think it was 100, 150 companies have probably shot up quite a lot since uh, the, um, this, the end of March there. We've got um, more pipeline to go forward. So it is there, but there is a, there is a demand for that service as well, so just to, to manage the kind of expectations on that. But it's really trying to uh, explore that. We also have a innovation workshops to try and uh, look at those ideas and try and see where the strengths and the weaknesses are as well. So um, what's what's there, and um, and and all the examples which are there, there there are there are benefits to doing this. It does it can take a long time. But um, you're better to be starting looking at these things now than being um, having to catch up. Okay, thanks for that, Colin. And I think that probably everyone here would agree with that. Um, certainly, something from from our point of view, we've sort of said, you know, get ahead of the curve. 
get you know get that sort of advantage so just before I wrap up I wanted to very quickly come to all of my panelists in turn and I'll just start with Warren and work my way sort of clockwise and um, if you had one sort of piece of advice and um, to give to a company that's on the, the webinar this morning what would it be and if they could ask that you could do it in about 30 seconds that'd be fantastic so if I could come to if I could come to Warren first and then I'll go to Michelle Lauren Joan and Warren. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. The sound disappeared for a minute. Um, yeah, one piece of advice, 30 seconds. Um, start with a, I would suggest, as we did, start with an environmental SWOT analysis. Um, I would look for gaps in the market. Look at circularity through the lens of innovation because there are huge opportunities. Most things are made in a linear way, which means most things are an opportunity. Um, even in traditional industries like ours, you can change the way it works as an epiphany. Um, we, we have to use specialist advice to get to where we are. Most of those are SMEs. So there are opportunities for companies, even we, we're large, but we're not that big. We're not a corporate, we're a private family business. Um, but we, we, you know, we, we can still innovate and lead the global market, even though we only represent less than 1% of the total global volume. Um, so I th to go back, I would say, look at it through the lens of innovation be creative and you might find very quickly that what you stumbled on is an opportunity that you never even thought was there brilliant thank you maybe a bit more than 30 seconds but i'll give you michelle <laughs> um think about everything you do and how you can do it better think about how badly things are done and what you could do to make it great just as joe has done just like what let it, you know, we can all make a difference don't make an impact but Start with what you want to do and think of how you would want it to be, and then you'll be able to find a way to do it. Thank you. Lawrence? Yeah, what I thought of was uh, take a local for local approach. So most of the resources and waste is, is created uh, in cities. Um, and, and to ship that back to where it originally was produced, uh, nonsense. So it applies the same to, to labor. Uh, it is a huge circular economy. It's a huge opportunity for local manufacturing. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, that would be my advice. Thank you, Joe. So for me, it's about networking, whether that's in your own industry or in other industries. So we were fortunate, as an example, to be able to go and meet with Iron Brew and discuss their bottle washing facility even though the bottle washing is no longer they still had the knowledge within that organization and that has fed into what we actually do here at beauty kitchen so it was networking through a different industry but transferring that knowledge over to our own industry and making it fit brilliant and colin uh just uh, from working with some companies, I would say that if you're making a product uh, that uh, you consider uh, how you would manage that product if it came back to the front of the factory gate and had to go through your process again. So made, um, made for remanufacture, made for longevity, um, materials savings. Um, there's, there's lots of potential there um, and happy to talk to you about that. Great, thank you. And thank you to all of our panellists this morning. It's been a, a fantastic discussion and hopefully um, our panellists enjoyed it and those joining us listening enjoyed it. So a massive thank you to everyone and to everyone for listening. Um, just a couple of last things just before you go off into the, the sunset since it's our last session. Um, if you would like to speak to the Circular Glasgow team at all or indeed Zero Waste Scotland, the expo space is there. Um, we are more than happy to help in the first instance. So please do sort of register your interest and we'll get back in touch with you. Um, we do also have a networking area that is available. If you haven't made use of it, please do so. You can send a message to people, do video chats or do some speed networking. So please do that. It will be open for about 30 minutes. So like Joe says, network, network to get work is a phrase that one of our colleagues uses. So I'd encourage you to do that. And finally, thank you. Thank you to everyone across the week who's been involved and thank you to all of our panelists, team and our delegates. Um, wish you all a good rest of day and have a good weekend when it comes. So thank you very much.